Well, let's uh, go ahead and start. We're going to be back in the book of Daniel this week, chapter 8. Um, we may, may not get through it all. Since the crowd's not very big, we might get through it all today. All right, so let's start with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this time you've set aside for us to come together in fellowship to study your word, Lord. As we go about today, we just ask that your spirit flow freely. Let my words be your words, and Lord, guide the discussion. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. So in previous chapters, we've seen the, the, vision, or the visions describing four kingdoms, the vision of Nebuchadnezzar, and then the vision of Daniel last week in um, seven, and the the four kingdoms are the Babylonian, the Medo-Persian, the Greek, and the Roman. In Daniel 8, Daniel relates another vision commonly called the vision of the ram and the goat, in which two kingdoms are described. As we shall see, the two kingdoms as the same as, as, the, same as the two of the four kingdoms in earlier visions, but just as the vision in Daniel 7, which I had an eye-opening thing last week, um, Related more information about the fourth kingdom. So now the vision in Daniel 8 provides information about the second and third kingdoms. So, so we don't chew off too much at one time. Let's read uh, 1 through 14, which is still quite a bit. But In the third year of the reign of Belshazzar the king, a vision appeared to me. Daniel, subsequent to the, to the one which appeared to me previously... I looked in the vision, and while I was looking, I was in the citadel of Susa, which is in the province of Elam, and I looked in the vision, and I myself was beside the Uli Canal. Then I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, a ram, which had two horns, was standing in front of the canal. Now the two horns were long, but one was longer than the other, and with, with the longer one coming up last, I saw the ram budding westward, northward, and southward, and no other beast could stand before him, nor was there anyone to rescue from his power. But he did as he pleased and magnified himself. While I was observing, behold, a male goat was coming from the west over the surface of the whole earth without touching the ground. And the goat had a, a conspicuous horn between his eyes. He, became, he came up to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing in front of the canal, and rushed at him in his mighty wrath. I saw him come beside the ram, and he was enraged at him. And he struck the ram and shattered his two horns, and the ram had no strength to withstand him. So he hurled him to the ground and trampled on him, and there was none to rescue the ram from his power. Then the male goat magnified himself exceedingly, but as soon as he was mighty, the large horn was broken, and its place there came up four conspicuous horns towards the four winds of heaven." Out of one of them came forth a rather small horn, which grew exceedingly great towards the south, toward the east, and toward the, the beautiful land. It grew up to the host of heaven and caused some of the host and some of the stars to fall to the earth, and it trampled that, them down. It even magnified itself to be equal with the commander of, of the host, and it removed the regular sacrifice from him, and the place of his sanctuary was thrown down. And on account of transgression, the host will be given over to the horn along with the regular sacrifice, and it will fling truth to the ground and perform it will and pro perform it will and prosper. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to that particular one who was speaking, How long will the, will the vision about the regular sacrifice apply while the transgression causes hor horror so as to allow both the holy place and the host to be trampled? He said to me, for 2,300 evenings and mornings, and the holy place will be properly restored. Is this battery going dead? You want to bring me two out of the cabinet? That's better. It's going to be a quick Bible study. 
So this, uh, this vision was received by Daniel in the third year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon. This would be about 552 B.C., is that correct? Two years later than the vision in Daniel 7. So in the vision, Daniel saw himself in Susa, in the province of Elam. That's uh, western Persia, which is modern-day Iran. Um, the winter capital of the Persian kings. He was by the river Uli. He saw a two-horned ram standing beside the river. The horns were high, with one higher than the other, which came up last. The ram was pushing westward, northward, and southward. No beast could withstand him. None could deliver from his hand. He did according, according to his will and became great. He saw a one-horned male goat coming suddenly from the west across the surface of the whole earth, not touching the ground, with a notable horn between his eyes. He saw the goat defeat the ram. With furious power, the goat attacked the ram and broke two of his horns, or broke his two horns. The ram was unable to withstand the goat and was trampled. The goat became great, but when he became strong, the large horn was broken. In its place, four notable ones came up toward the four winds of heaven. He saw a little horn. So, Jim, what are your thoughts on this? situation at hand wasn't wasn't going to continue. Okay. And I think he was trying to break us into the idea that, that we were going to get prophecy from Daniel all the way through uh, Daniel's writings. What do you think the goat represents? I'm not sure. Obviously, the goat had a lot of power, and more power than the ram. I, I don't know why that's the way the... Uh, the ram represents the Medo-Persian Empire. What does the goat represent? Greece. So that's why the goat would be more superior, right? Right. Because that's going to be the next next power of the world. Yeah. The next up and coming power is going to be the Greek Empire. And uh, let me flip through my notes real quick. I I put in here Alexander the Great. Well, you can go that far. Yeah. 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 Uh, we'll get to that in a second. Okay. So Daniel heard a conversation between holy ones, one asking how long will the vision be concerning the daily sacrifices and the trans transgression of the desolation, the giving of both of the sanctuary and the host, of the tramp host to be trampled underfoot. The reply given to Daniel was for 2,300 years, then the sanctuary shall be clean, cleansed. With the details before us, we are now ready to consider the explanation from from Daniel here. So um, so we don't chew off too much at a time. Let's do 15 through 16. When I, Daniel, had seen the vision, I sought to understand it, and behold, standing before me was one who looked like a man. And I heard the voice of a man between the banks of Uli, and he called out and said, Gabriel, give this man an understanding of the vision. So that pretty much tells us that's the angel Gabriel, right? So then 17 through 19... So he came, to, came near to, me, to where I was standing, and when he, became, when he came, I was frightened and, so, and fell on my face, but said to me, Son of man, understand that the vision pertains to the time of the end. Now while he was talking with me, I sank into a deep sleep with my face to the ground, but he touched me and made me stand upright. He said, Behold, I am going to let you know what will occur at the final period of indignation for it pertains to the appointed time of the end. Mm -hmm. Trying not to get too far ahead of myself. So he approaches Daniel, Daniel, prompting Daniel to fall on his face, and we've seen this time and time again throughout the Bible. 
telling him that the vision refers to the time of the end. He stands Daniel on his feet, for Daniel had fallen into this deep sleep with his face to the ground, to tell him what shall happen in a latter time, for at the appointed time the end shall be. Gabriel goes on to explain the vision. The ram which you saw with the two horns represents the kings of Media and Persia. Mm, not sure. Um, that, so, no, I didn't get that far up. You're you're a little ahead. You're a little ahead of me. Just give. Me, I'll get there. Yeah. Slow down. Slow down. You're going faster than me. Yeah, I was. I stopped at uh, nineteen. Okay. Or. I just read 20, which is the ram which, which you saw with the two horns represents the kings of Media and Persia. That depicts the, the kings of Media and Persia. The larger horn may, rep, may represent Persia's greater influ, influence. The expansion of the Medo-Persian Empire illustrated by the ram was pushing westward, northward, and southward. And if we, Because we have hindsight, we can look back and we can see that that's what happened. Um, so the shaggy goat represents the kingdom of Greece, and the large horn that is be- between his eyes is the first king. See, it was a trick question earlier, Jimmy. This depicts the, ki- the kingdom of Greece. Note that it came from the west. The large horn representing its first king, which is Alexander the Great. The speed of the goat aptly reflects Alexander's conquest. And we, if we look at the... Yeah. If, we, if we look back in history, it, it was... Re- relatively rapid. Alexander defeated the Persians in three de- de- decisive battles at Granicus, at Is- uh, Issus, and at Guagam- Guagamela. Jim's not here to correct me on my grammar today. So. Um, so let's look at 22. The broken horn and the four horns that arose in its place represent four kingdoms which will arise from his nation, although not with his power. Where was it? Okay, the one-horned male goat depicts the kingdom of Greece. Note that it came from the west. The large horn representing its first king, Alexander the Great. The speed of the goat. And then the broken horn and the four horns that arose in its place. Alexander died at 33 years of age. So I made it longer than Alexander the Great. I don't know about you guys. You guys are still getting there, right? (laughs) Man, I'm glad I numbered these pages. I almost missed the whole page. His empire was then divided between his four generals. Ptolemy, which is Egypt. um, Seleucus I, which is Syria. Cassander, which is Macedonia and Greece. And I'm going to butcher this one really bad. Lysimachus, Thrace and Asia Minor. The little horn that became exceedingly great. So let's look at that one. We're, get, we're getting there. I'm, got, I'm at 23 now. In the latter period of the rule, when the transgressors have run their course, a king will arise. Insolent and skilled in intrigue, his power will be mighty, but not by his own power. And he will destroy to an extraordinary degree and, proper, and prosper and perform his will. He will destroy mighty men and the holy people. And through his shrewdness, he will cause deceit to succeed by his, his influence and will magnify himself in his heart, and he will destroy many while they are at ease. He will even propose the prince of princes. He will be broken without human agency. That's a lot to chew off there. So, um, so sometime later a king shall arise. When transgressors have reached their fullness, when Israel has fallen back into sin. Because Israel does this time and time again, and we do this time and time and again. We just... We just keep going back. History repeats itself. And that's why it's so important 
to not just focus on the New Testament. You've got to focus on the Old Testament. Because if you don't study the past, you're destined to repeat it. We have to learn from this. With mighty power, but not his own, who shall destroy fearfully, prosper, and thrive, who shall destroy the mighty and also the holy people. Through cunning, he shall cause deceit to prosper. He shall magnify himself and destroy many in their prosperity. He shall, uh, he shall ri even rise against the prince of princes, God himself. But he shall be broken without humankind. God shall destroy him. And this is, this is Lucy. This is most likely... Antiochus Epiph Epiphanes, ruler of Syria, 175 through 163 B.C., who imposed Greek culture and deities upon his subjects, who, when he conquered Jerusalem, set up an image in the temple, offered swine flesh upon the altar, which big no-no in Jewish culture, encouraged Greek soldiers to commit fornication in the temple, forbade circumcision, keeping the Sabbath, and, possess, and possessing a copy of the, strict, uh, of the scriptures. I know to tell you those things. Guys, the illness and the accident, God destroyed him. What I think is really, really intriguing here is all of these things that Antiochus had done. And I kind of apply that to today, and we can see it happening again. We're going to talk a little bit about it today in sermon, but because I wrote a special sermon just for today. Um, after doing this study <laughs> yesterday, I rewrote it this morning at like four in the morning. Um, so, I, but I think this is, this continues to happen. Our religious freedoms keep getting taken from us. And but you know, humankind has only tolerated so long, just like under him. He was a really nasty guy, and then what happened? The Jews actually ended up revolting against him because it, it went over where they could possibly. Right. And I got a feeling that maybe in mm. the world right now we're coming I, to I think I think you might be correct, Jim. I think that uh, that it's coming to a to a head, for sure. Um, the vision of the evenings and the mornings. So uh, twenty six. The vision of the evenings and the mornings, which has been told, is true. But keep the vis vision secret, for it pertains to many days in the future. The number of days the sacrifices will cease and the temple desolated. Maybe, maybe it's a literal period, a little over six years, corresponding to the actual period of time the abomination by Antiochus occurred. But Daniel was instructed to seal up the vision, for it was to occur many days in the future. And I'm going to touch on that in a second. So almost 400 years later is when that happened. Why do you, why do you think Daniel was told to keep it a secret? Prophesizing for what was going to happen so far in advance that, that maybe that was not going to be able to be interpreted properly by, by anybody. So if we if we take let's, what if we were to apply that same um, rhetoric, if you will, to Revelations. Was that supposed to be kept a secret? I think for the time uh, John was asked to write it, it was no longer to be kept a secret by those who knew about the idea of the creator God. But it was so written that the, the people that weren't into that would interpret nothing constructive out of it. Uh, without a background, Revelation is garbage. I mean, you would have a hard time getting anything out of it fresh. I agree with that. I think, 
Revelation is, Molly was asking me about Revelation yesterday too. It's kind of funny. She said, a lot of pastors don't do Revelation. You should do a Bible study on Revelation. And I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm just not quite for sure I'm ready for that yet. Um, it's kind of like a review of everything you've been with before. And with what is going to be in the future all mixed together. So it makes it a pretty tough thing to handle. We're not probably ready for it yet either. <laughs> It's, Revelation is, very, is a very, very, very difficult book. It's so difficult, there's a lot of Christians that don't even accept it for, uh, as a word-for-word word, uh, entry. You know, they, they can't get a grasp on anything, and they're not sure why it's there. I had a... Jim did some preaching on it. Yeah, I did. 2016 and 2019... And Don Heron. Don did one? And what oh, I man, I wish I would have had the tape for that. That probably would have been pretty good. God is in control of everything in his awesome power. Yeah. Don inspired me to do a lot of studying. And, uh, we did that in Bible study with Don Heron. Yeah. 22, 2009, 2010. I don't know with Jim. Probably since it was those But John inspired me to look into the Bible in, in a lot more, uh, a deeper way because he didn't go into a lot of detail on, on, on things and that left me questioning. Yeah. And so therefore, you know, you can say, well, what he did wasn't complete or good, but yet it was really good for me because that was the extra inspiration I needed to try to answer what John didn't answer. Well, and see, and that's what I'm... Um that's kind of where I'm at with like doing the Bible study like, in this like open forum, open discussion format is I'm learning too. So that's how Bible study should be. It should be an open discussion. We should be learning from each other. And if we come up with questions like last week with the four kingdoms and Bill saying, well, maybe the, the, the Roman Catholic Church hasn't ended yet. So don't you think it could be, man, that changed my entire outlook on Daniel. There's a lot of people that have that view that the fourth kingdom has not concluded what the uh, what they talked about. It, it was it it was interesting because I thought I kind of went along with tradition as it's it was ended. Like we're we're looking hindsight. I never really thought to look similarly it forward. Pretty well ended, but but uh, from a, a spiritual point of view, the Roman Catholic Church is the largest church in the entire world. Yeah. Christian, Christianity is the largest block religion, and out of Christianity, the Roman Catholic Church is the largest. I just thought that was, I thought that was really interesting. I, I, I think I agree with you, Jim, that it was kept secret because people wouldn't, people wouldn't really understand it, but this is the thing, is this is probably one of the easiest ones easiest visions for us now to understand. Yeah, it was very well explained. Yeah, <laughs> it was very well explained. Um, so then it says, then I, Daniel, was exhausted and sick for days. Then I caught up again and carried on the king's business. But I was astounded at the vision and there was none to explain it. So he was fainted and sick for days. Though he afterward arose and went about the king's business, he was astonished by the vision, but no one understood stood it. I, I mean, I thought, again, I'm looking at it hindsight, though, because it was pretty, looking back, of course, I have historical data to say, well, this is exactly what happened, you know, exactly what was said happened, but I don't know, I can't, I can't seem to separate myself from having that history and put myself in Daniel's shoe to understand why, why he wouldn't have understood it. Imagine how heavy that was on Daniel. Because nobody in the world has ever heard about some of these things that, that were prophesied to Daniel. So, I mean, he was getting a, a big time charge. Yeah, he had, big, he had a big weight on his shoulders there, and then he had to keep quiet about it, too. 
So, like I said, this, this vision is probably the easiest to understand of the four visions that Daniel saw. The identity of the ram and the goat are cl clearly given, but it's only that history confirms what was described in the vision. So the conflict from, between Medo-Persia and Greece, that's pretty easy, pretty clear. Uh, the division of the Grecian Empire following Alexander's de death, that was pretty clear. The rise of Antiochus and his discretion of the temple, or desecration of the temple in Jerusalem, we have history to show that. Um, the purpose of the, vision, of the vision was to prepare the people of Daniel for what was about to come in the time of the end, in the latter time of indignation. The persecution that would come upon Israel toward the end of the Old Testament period during the intertestamental inter period. The remarkable accuracy, accuracy of this vision has led some to date the book of Daniel after the events of Antiochus. Well, that's what you do when you <laughs> right, right. But its accuracy poses no problem for those who accept the inspiration of the scriptures and should remind us of God's power to fulfill his word. So I don't, I don't agree with that. I don't believe that this was written after Antiochus. I believe this was written at the time that it claims that it was written. It's prophecy. That's what it is. And it, it confirms our faith. I think you, it was trying to start to tell the world that Everything was going to gradually change, and that things were going to get better when when Christ came. What we refer to as the, the second time. Uh, that that whole concept of the of the world realizing that we're working under uh, the Creator God of the universe, and that when He becomes directly in charge as the boss, as the King of the Earth not going to be the way it is now as we stumble around. And I think God is purposely didn't come earlier because he wanted us to try to figure out what was going on and what we do right and wrong. So the whole idea is that God is holding off for the end of the world, waiting on us to be ready for it. It's not that we were, God is needing to get ready for it. We need to get ready for it. Because God wants to come when we will, as a, as a world, be willing to accept it. And I think that's, and that is what the Jewish point of view as well. They feel that we need to clean up our act and figure out what's going on. And uh, we've had enough time and enough uh, information given to us. And when we get to a level that God figures we're worth dealing with, he's going to show up. And that might not be too long in the future. I don't know. We were just talking about the well, you know, the, the, the push, Jewish, right? Yeah, the Jewish tradition that the, the Messiah, you know, is going to come, and he's going to come before the year 6,000. And they're counting from the beginning of time when man was on earth. So that means that there's like 217 more years before uh, that God has to come before the day, uh, the year 6,000. And, and so they, they, he didn't say he's going to come on that year. He's going to come before it. So, some, so he never tells when. He could have come in earlier, but obviously he didn't. So there's 200 more years that we don't know when he's going to come during. And that's based on the idea that they think mankind is going to pretty well run the gamut by then. And, uh, and God has already projected approximately that time in history. But between now and the next 200 years, God is going to show up. And that, that carries over to a lot of the Christian viewpoint as well. The idea that we're in the end time. We're getting close. And we need to start shaping up. I always say that, uh, I think I said this last week too, from the time that Jesus died, we've been in the end times. That's it. I mean... Sure, I could say that. I'm not going to tell you that it's going to be tomorrow, ever. Um, I'm not going to tell you that it's going to be in 200 years, because I don't know. It, sa it says right here in the book that nobody knows. Jesus didn't even know. So I'm not, I'm not going to put a time on it. But 
Nancy, you, you're awful quiet every week, and since there's not a whole lot of people here, but let's, get, let's get some thoughts. <laughs> okay. What do, you, what do you take away from it? What's your takeaway? Get right. Exactly. Get right. It's time. It, it is time. Well, because there wasn't a whole lot of people here, I ran through the entire chapter of eight without a whole lot of things. So um, I put in a passage here from Isaiah 46, 9 through 11, um, just to kind of leave you guys with this as we go into next week's study. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Calling a bird of prey from the east, the man who ex executes my counsel from a far country. Indeed, I have spoken. I will also bring it to pass. I have proposed it. I will also do it. So I think that pretty much aligns with what Jim was saying. God's, God's going to do it. He already said he was going to do it. He's just waiting for us to get ready. It's like when Noah left the pigeons go to see if they could find dry land. He left the window open so that they had a place to be able to come back and land. So, you know, we don't know what's going to happen in the future, but at least make it so it can happen in, in a positive way. So leave, the, so leave the window open. Leave the window open. God's going to show up when you still know exactly when. That's right. All right, well, let's go, let's go ahead and close in prayer. We'll, we'll take a few extra minutes today. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to, again, thank you for the discussion here. It's always a pleasure to have your spirit with us and guide these discussions, Lord. As we go about the rest of the week and the rest of the service, have your spirit stay with us here. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.